with the title of University of Geneva's Innovation Funds Supporting Continuing Education Constant Development, presented by Sophie Huber. Sophie, who got her doctorate in International Affairs at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, is currently Director of the Center for Continuing and Distant Education at the University of Geneva. Sophie has previously held various management positions in the Graduate Institution of Geneva as Executive Director. Sophie has extensive knowledge and experience in finance at the university level and will show, will show us today some important aspects in relation to finance in the field of continuing education. During the development of the webinar, we will, sort, uh, we will organize and sort the question of the participants so that Sophie can answer them at the end of uh, her speech. I give the word to Sophie. Thank you very much, uh, Juan Carlos. And um, it's a pleasure meeting Anna and Ilse, if you may, if I may. Uh, so I'm, I'm Sophie, and uh, although the, the the, the, the general theme or topic of, of uh, finances isn't uh, always the first one we think about when uh, discussing continuing education. Um, it is still uh, very important, especially to support uh, constant development. So I will be using as a support to my webinar uh, some few, uh, few slides that you will show on the right-hand side of, you, of your screen. As said by Juan Carlos, best would be for you to type in the chat zone uh, your questions. Uh, Juan and Carme will help me uh, synthesize them, and I hope I'll have answers for you at the at the end of, of the webinar. Um, let's start. I think in about 15 minutes or so, you will know everything about University of Geneva's Innovation Fund, or hopefully. So uh, just to start with, I wanted in my first slide to introduce you a little bit to the very specific context uh, in Switzerland. Um, and this will help you understand uh, why we started this innovation fund. Back in the early 1990s, uh, most Swiss universities already had some continuing education programs uh, in the format of diplomas. Uh, where they would welcome professionals who were former students of them, mostly in medical science uh, and psychology and educational sciences. However, uh, the demand was growing and there was a need also uh, from the general, um, let's say, labor market uh, to welcome um, more um, training from uh, universities to continue educate uh, the workforce, especially those who already had a university degree. So in early 1990s, the Swiss Federal Council adopted a strategy and a financial plan, that was the interesting part, uh, to help universities actually develop and launch more continuing education activities, be they very short ones, uh, like um, cycles of conferences or uh, daily sessions or degree granting programs, really. Um, and uh, as said, a strong financial envelope was linked to that strategy. It helped, of course, uh, the, the universities uh, develop not only new programs, but also teams uh, who were dedicated to running those continuing education activities. Now, as all good things, um, this uh, financial plan had a, a, an end date and that was in the early uh, 2000s. So early 2000s, uh, here we are as universities um, somehow faced with the end of all financial support um, to and still with the request to continue launching more continuing education activities. Uh, so university at that point had to ensure the financial sustainability of all activities who were already running and at the same time try to find a new scheme to continue developing new ones. So uh, as of that point, as of the early 2000s, we're in the financial scheme that we have today. Tuition fees, uh, rather high ones, are collected from participants enrolling in executive and 
continuing education in general, to cover, of course, all the program's direct costs. And the institution, the University of Geneva itself, is collecting an overhead uh, to cover for institutional services. So that scheme somehow covers direct costs. And the institutional services were still missing the seed money to continue launching new education and uh, continuing education activities. And that's when I'm moving to slide number three. Uh, where uh, you can see that as of 2002, there was a decision at the rectorate level that part of the, over of the overheads collected would be channeled to an innovation fund dedicate dedicating specifically to supporting continuing education programs. And that was uh, named the Continuing Education Support and Innovation Fund. It was born at that time at a really a rector, by a rectoral uh, decision. Originally, the fund supported really the creation of new and innovative programs. So the subsidies would cover the programs, what we could call the investment phase, until the program was launched and the tuition fees collected. So all that period where um, we're launching a market analysis, where uh, professors, uh, research assistants, teaching assistants, administrative assistants were working hard uh, to create the program, all that investment phase uh, was supported by the fund. And a few years later, let's say, in a, I think the first uh, decision in that direction I saw was in 2008, uh, the fund also started supporting programs which, were, um, which hadn't benefited from a support during that investment phase, which had found alternative financial means. But just before launch, they realized that they were missing one or two participants to actually um, cover all their costs and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, be, um, be self-sustaining. So the fund started also offering a sort of an insurance scheme to cover potential deficits. So programs who had invested to, uh, to, to, to start and to be created could actually launch, although they weren't entirely self-financing. And those deficits would then be covered by, by the fund. So let's say that as of the early 2000s, after a brilliant period of 10 years where um, federal money actually had come into continuing education supporting the launch, uh, the University of Geneva found an alternative financial scheme to continue supporting um, the creation of new executive education programs, while at the same time, I would say, um, respecting the the self uh, the self financing principle uh, that is guiding uh, continuing education in uh, in Switzerland. So that was for for the history. Uh, now, as of two thousand. The entire university community, all the professors, uh, knew that this fund was available should they uh, feel like venturing into continuing education. Now, uh, what are today uh, the strategic objectives? Well, we reviewed them uh, together with a commission uh, where um, members coming from the nine University of Geneva faculties and four inter, what we call interfaculty centers. Um, so about 13, 14 members total in that commission. So that commission uh, back in 2016 reviewed uh, the working of the, of the fund and renewed uh, the strategic objectives. We're still supporting programs before launch. Um, but we also know supporting programs who have lived, uh, let's say, for five, six years and need a relaunch, uh, where professors want to reinvest in their programs, for example, in uh, with adding new research, uh, transforming the format from presential to e-learning format. So that's a, that's a new avenue. So supporting also relaunch of programs. And we're still providing insurance for potential and very limited deficits. Uh, 
Now, to be qualified for funding, uh, and it seems quite obvious, the programs should tackle one or more of the university uh, strategic objectives. Uh, and uh, those, you find them in the University 2025 strategic plan. And we focus specifically on innovation, which is a very large concept, actually. Uh, we wanted also the programs um, benefiting from the subsidies to show how they could transfer um, the, the skills the participants would uh, would acquire, but also potentially um, tools uh, or approaches to the economic and social ecosystem of Geneva in Switzerland. We also wanted those programs to have a specific link to international Geneva, and I may say a, a word about that uh, in, a, in a minute. And we also wanted those programs uh, somehow to work into the direction of uh, one of the university's main objective recently, which is the promotion of lifelong learning, LLM. So those are the strategic objectives as per se that the university is, is offering and where the continuing education programs need somehow to, to fit. At the same time, of course, the programs should contribute to continuing education's own uh, strategic objective, mainly uh, digitalization and internationalization. Uh, by digitalization, we mean that uh, we are really favoring uh, programs uh, or favoring, let's say, the introduction of uh, e-learning formats into continuing education programs. And by internationalization, uh, we mean that we, we support uh, the development of programs or the, let's say the relaunch of programs, which have a specific focus on either international participants, on international Geneva, which is actually that part of Geneva welcoming all the international organizations, international non-governmental organizations, all the MNEs, uh, multinational uh, enterprises who have their European or MENA headquarters here in Geneva. So internationalization is meant to open up continuing ed education programs to participants from, from those um, organizations at the same time as opening up to partners in uh, other countries and potentially creating programs uh, with uh, colleagues and universities in China or in the US or in South Africa, uh, you, you name it. Now, um, we had a, a wonderful discussion um, during that strategic review at the Commission um, because uh, a, a lot was discussed, of course, around the, the, the concept of innovation. And we ended up, um, um, let's say, deciding for ourselves uh, that we still wanted to, to have, uh, although the, let's say, although the process was quite administrative and we were talking about finances, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, continuing education has to be self-financing and has to tackle market uh, needs. We still wanted to support projects which were creative, audacious, sometimes even risky, um, where the market was not entirely identified, but where we felt there was some sort of a normative message also to be sent out by, by the university. So those were and still are the strategic objectives uh, that are behind uh, the, the fund today. Now, um, what kind of programs are actually supported? And that would be slide number five that I just transferred to. Now, for the past three years, um, mostly degree granting programs uh, with a strong digital component have been supported. The shorter programs, the conferences, uh, the one-day programs sometimes receive support, but it's um, it, we usually support more uh, the degree granting programs, which also require, of course, more investment. Uh, a vast majority of the programs supported were brand new, uh, but there is also a growing number of programs that are existing and that are being transformed. I'm sorry, and that need uh, money again and investment to be to be transformed. 
No, of course, uh, due to the internal university dynamics, programs from all faculties and also from the inter-faculty centers have been supported. So you go from medicine uh, to geomatics in the environmental sciences to religion and society in the faculty of, of humanities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a wide spectrum of, uh, of programs um, that have been um, it has been actually supported. Now, we're talking about money, and I haven't cited any number yet. Uh, so here are the first ones. The subsidies cover up to 45,000 Swiss francs. Um, that's close to 45,000 euros, um, let's say, during the investment phase. And uh, that money would cover, for example, the, the writing of a market analysis, uh, coordinators or a research assistant, a teaching assistant, or an administrative assistant salaries during a, a few months, uh, as well as promotion costs. So ads, uh, social networks, um, paid campaigns, um, video teasers that have to be created, etc., etc. A few program, only few programs, ask for such uh, a, a big amount. The, the average request is for about 15,000 Swiss francs, knowing that programs, especially the ones that are already existing and who are being transformed, they usually use what we call their reserve. You know, if there have been any benefits from previous editions, they usually put it on their own uh, reserve uh, fund and use that then to, um, to transform. Now, def def deficit entrances are much lower. Uh, of course, they are much fewer as well. Uh, usually two or three programs every year, not more. Uh, and those can require up to 15,000 Swiss francs to really to, to cover up. Of course, deficit insurance can only uh, be requested and, and received uh, once. Uh, if the program doesn't use it, then you can requested another time, uh, but um, a deficit is offered, a deficit insurance is offered once only um, uh, at, at a later stage, uh, the program should either uh, transform itself or, or close. And that, that happens sometimes, of course, because we are, we, um, um, let's say, we were working in the, in the market, per se. So those are um, the programs, uh, an overview, let's say, of the programs supported. And I would now uh, move to slide number six to tell you a little bit about administration, because that's somehow uh, what, what drives it all and makes it, makes it work. Um, we had a number of conversations, not heated though, on how we should uh, we should pro, uh, pro, how we should process requests. Should there be a yearly deadline or is a deadline every semester or so? And in the end, we realized that continuing education really needed uh, some flexibility. So the fund welcomes requests for funding all year long. There are no deadlines. Um, professors who have uh, ideas uh, can request. Um, um, any time somehow. What they should do is draft a project proposal, and we'll discuss it later on, receive the support of their dean uh, in the faculty, and receive the support of the rectorate uh, in its entirety. So it's, it's quite, uh, uh, I would say, uh, demanding uh, first step. Uh, then the request is submitted uh, to us at the Center for Continuing and Distance Education. What we do is we check whether you know the, the salaries correspond to the, the, the scale of the university, whether the, the, the envelope is, is uh, let's say, uh, realistic, whether it is too much or too, too low. And um, then once uh, we, we clear it, uh, we send the proposal to that interfaculty commission I told you about for consultation. So at that point, the, um, let's say the, the, the process is, is very open. All faculties uh, are present and represented with the then commission, so they, they are always judge and party at the same time because all of them at some point see a professor of their faculty requesting some funding. Uh, so right now we usually say okay to almost all proposals. Um, they are of course rather uh, 
well built, but it's also that internal dynamic uh, that, that enables for a very smooth process. In the end, it's the vice rector in charge of continuing education who gives the final approval uh, for the funds uh, to be dispersed. The request loop takes really a maximum of four weeks once the center receives the proposal um, because sometimes there's discussion within the, um, uh, within the, the interfaculty commission uh, and you know there are some conditions uh, or some questions asked to the to the professors so there's some back and forth let's say uh, but but really not much at the end um, of the project once the fund has been granted and the program is launched professor Professors are then invited to submit a short report uh, or present a case study uh, during one of our workshops. Uh, that enables for so, some sort of a feedback loop uh, and it's, it's part of our scheme for, for knowledge management. Um, what I wanted to say is that administration uh, was, uh, um, was at some point, uh, let's say, a, a point or topic of, uh, of some worries uh, among, among uh, professors who are launching uh, continuing education programs, wondering whether it's going to take long. I must admit at the center, I also had questions whether this would be um, actually efficient and uh, how, how time consuming it would be. And uh, we had... Uh, a first um, discussion about that procedure uh, a few weeks back with our colleagues at the, at the Interfaculty Commission and we realized that although quite administrative, although time consuming, the process really enabled for some exchanges uh, uh, and very substantial ones and regular ones among faculties and that continuing education uh, at large was actually benefiting from that continuing and continuous dialogue among, among faculties. So much so that that procedure has also been replicated now for other funds that the university is, um, is actually uh, uh, managing uh, for other types of projects, be they research projects or the creation of bachelor or master's programs. So it's, uh, it was quite a success, I would say. Now, um, I wanted to share with you in the slide number seven uh, what the, the request form actually entails. Um, and uh, you, may, you may see that we really wanted professors to, uh, to take some time uh, writing uh, their request. Um, of course, uh, the, the criteria there uh, are rather um, usual, I would say, close to any other um, request fund. Um, so I won't go into detail there. Uh, I just wanted to share it with you so that uh, at a later stage you may want to enter into the discussion. Now, uh, last but not least, slide number eight, I just wanted to uh, let you know that uh, as of 2016, the fund also started supporting activities that are not directly related to the launch of new programs or to the relaunch of programs or to deficits of programs, uh, but uh, also other activities, uh, for example, workshops. Uh, that are open to all uh, initial staff who are, who are managing or teaching in a continuing edu education programs. We ran about 15 of them uh, during the year, so it's like our own self little executive education program. Um, we also support the participation of, um, let's say, our uh, staff enrollment in, uh, in relevant programs. Uh, for example, a number of coordinators and even sometimes professors have recently enrolled in our uh, certificate for e-learning. Uh, and that was really useful because uh, it, it helped us not only ensure that um, our community has uh, the skills required to go into digitalization, but that specific certificate was also then uh, very, very healthy in terms of finance because welcoming uh, internal participants. Uh, the fund is also finally also supporting strategic projects uh, like studies, especially market studies or um, uh, the, the development of, of specific tools, uh, the conference organizations or specific promotion campaigns. So we, we have a, a rather, um, let's say, powerful 
a tool uh, at our disposal with the fund. And the good part is that the entire university, the, all the faculties and the interfaculty centers are, uh, really have a say in its, uh, in its management. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here because I've been talking a lot and uh, I hope you have questions and I hope I can answer them. Thank you so much. <laughs> So, thank you very much, Sophie, for your interesting presentation uh, with ideas that will be very useful for, for us. Um, I've been quite uh, surprised that you, you work in a way that we, we also try to, to follow. And some ideas, as you've told us, as that to promote even uh, creative, uh, audacious, and even risky uh, projects. I will. I, I feel very identified with with that uh, aim and line of working. Uh, also, that uh, some programs are have been uh, transformed from previous programs because I think that uh, is not just lifelong learning, but also lifelong transforming programs. We have to update programs to to uh, to open the program to new technologies, to new ways of mm, offer our programs all around the world. Um, also, uh, that uh, you, you also count on all the faculties, you know, you, you are uh, you know, mm, a focus on the, and concentrated on not just one line of programs, but in all the areas, and the idea of funding those programs is really uh, a challenge. And also I take uh, into account that there are no many numbers in your presentation, but the numbers that you told us are really quite uh, important as the, the, the average for its program that I will uh, take as a, a reference for, for, for me. Um, well, I, I don't know if uh, there are some questions by the uh, participants, and, and, and I also want to, to thank all the participants in this webinar organized by, by UKEM. And I don't know if the, well, Carmen has been checking the the questions, and I want to insist that this being recorded and that we will put this uh, webinar at the UCAN members' uh, disposal. So I will try to promote the rest of uh, UCAN members to, to join in and to consultate it. Um, I always I also want to to remind you that uh, I would like to see all of you at uh, the 50th conference of UK next June in, in Bergen that uh, we will uh, probably create uh, um, a work, a corporate uh, of a work uh, team about uh, funds for continuing education. I want you to, to join that, that group. And also before finishing, if there is no uh, question for Sophie, I will uh, like you to enjoy a really happy Easter holidays that here in Spain we are in some hour uh, going to, to begin. Juan Carlos, I think there are one question by Alfredo, so, and I also uh, have a question. Carmen, uh, yes, I don't know if you, you are listening to us. So I see um, the question by Alfredo, and hello okay. Alfredo, it's nice so to, thank to you have you online. all of you. Bye. So, um, Alfredo, I'll... Um, I'm looking for my my slide where I could uh, 
I could explain exactly where the funding comes from. Let's go back. Um, Yes, right here. So Alfredo, the deficit insurances. The way it works is that, um, let's say a, a certificate has been launched, it's the first, second, third edition, and let's say a month to the starting date, they are missing three participants uh, to break even. Um, that's about, let's say, they, they are missing 15 Swiss francs uh, to break even. Um, they consider it important that the program uh, is uh, is running uh, be because it answers a specific need uh, and because other participants have already um, enrolled, uh, everything is, is ready, uh, it would be pity somehow to miss the opportunity to, to run the program. So what happens is that the request for funding then uh, arrives at the center a few weeks before the program launch uh, with the, the, the details of uh, what what money is missing and why, uh, all the efforts that have been done, for example, to recruit further participants and uh, the difficulties encountered. Um, then we usually go very fast uh, in answering the request uh, and uh, the, the funding comes again from that general support and innovation fund. That support and innovation fund, whatever the activities that we are uh, financing, including the deficits, um, uh, the funding comes from overheads. Every program collects overheads uh, that are usually used to cover uh, institutional costs in part of the overheads collected are channeled to the innovation fund. So it's a, it's a big pocket um, that is actually um, nurtured and, uh, and uh, where the funding is provided by overheads. That's the scheme. Uh, does it answer you, your question? Is it clear or not? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Now, Carmen, you're wondering uh, whether uh, other universities have uh, such a funding scheme. Uh, to my knowledge, we're the only one, and uh, some of our colleagues are very jealous of that of that scheme. It it is also because we started it very early on uh, that it, uh, it it works pretty well. Uh, it's uh, it's sort of part of the of the usual process of running continuing education at the at the University of Geneva. Um, the university, as said, has other such uh, what we call development funds, strategic reserves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so the university has a culture of, of sustaining uh, uh, or, or supporting the launch of, uh, of programs and, and projects. Uh, but in terms of continuing education, we're, we're uh, to my knowledge, we're the only one to, to work this way. So I see uh, you're fine with, with my answer. Um, I don't know if Ilze, you you have a a final question. I see all of you typing now <laughs> in the in the chat session. That's excellent. So Ilse, you wonder whether one program can receive funding multiple times. Now, a new program uh, which is being launched uh, receives that seed money uh, once and then we, it is requested to actually try and introduce within its own budget what we call uh, a line to create um, reserves. So uh, the programs should make an effort to put some money aside uh, each time, each edition it is running, so that they create their own uh, you know, mini innovation fund that they can then uh, reuse for later in, uh, editions and for uh, potentially um, adaptations. Um, now, let's say a program has received funding for its launch. 
and uh, six or seven years later it wants to adapt, transform. Uh, it's going to use its reserves but it doesn't want to empty that reserve fund. Um, it, could, it can request uh, another funding. Uh, if at that stage, after six or seven editions as well, a program realizes it's going to be close, uh, it it's, it's may face a deficit, it can also uh, request the funding. Usually, um, programs receive um, fundings uh, usually once uh, for their launch and uh, let's say in the in the decade following the launch another time for adaptation or or deficit um, the only fun, uh, funding they receive only once that's deficit uh, if another year is faced with a deficit then the program has to close and sometimes the faculty has to cover the the deficit so i i hope that that helps ilse Uh, Carmi, I see you um, You had another uh, question about internationalization, yes. Um, the, the university in general is, is really um, looking at in being as international as possible, both in, in research, uh, in its uh, initial studies, bachelor, master's, PhD programs, but also in continuing education. What it means for continuing education is that very often indeed we have to um, adapt programs in terms of uh, content, uh, shifting for example to English, which may uh, require some, uh, some seed money for, for translation purposes. And uh, we also, uh, of course, do change formats, uh, favoring uh, e-learning formats uh, so that participants uh, do not have to travel to Geneva to, to join the program. No, um, that's, let's say, for programs who exist, who run already, who want to transform themselves, and who want to welcome international participants. No, we also do have um, professors who are very ambitious and want to launch programs with international partners. And that uh, started, for example, two years ago with the University of Tsinghua in China. And we have a project currently going on with a partner university in, um, in the Netherlands and in New York. So those are, this is also one way to internationalize continuing education, is launching new programs with international partners, uh, programs who are meant to uh, uh, really, um, let's say, answer the training needs of an international audience. And most of those programs then are uh, e-learning or have a very strong e-learning component so that um, we avoid uh, too much cost for participants and we also, uh, let's say, environmentally friendly. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's also important. Now, um, Carmi, I see um, that uh, you you have questions about standard students and Juan Carlos, maybe that your question uh, is close to Carmi's. You want to know whether there's a specific amount in the budget for for scholarships. Um, let me uh, let me say this: uh, most programs really run and are supposed to be self-financed on tuition fees. Now, some of them um, tuition fees are sometimes just too uh, too high for international students or, um, let's say, a specific audience like uh, migrants or refugees. So usually the program director then looks for subsidies, um, looking for, um, uh, let's say, funding from um, um, foundations. I was looking for the word. Uh, so there's a, there are scholarship requests. Uh, to foundations, a scholarship requests to specific uh, funds, uh, either in the city of Geneva or at the at the federal level, um, for for specific publics. Uh, usually, uh, the programs themselves do not um, add a scholarship line within within their budget. They are looking for additional resources.
all clear. Wonderful. I see no one else is typing. It may mean that we have come to, to the end of the webinar. Yeah, okay. So, thank you in this second part of the webinar that you will, that you have joined with uh, very interesting questions and even more interesting answer from Sophie that have uh, clarified quite well some doubts uh, we, we had. Uh, I noticed that uh, maybe there is no more question because we, we are uh, uh, watching the, the chat. Uh, and I, I, I was seeing that uh, one of the participants were uh, were typing, so <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, in their name I again thank uh, Sophie uh, for her webinar. Uh, I think that it is just um, a beginning of uh, uh, even a wider chat with other participants because I think uh, the ideas in this webinar uh, interest all of us and we have uh, the same uh, I think policy or very clear policies about continuing education. So well I think that uh, time is end and I hope you as I said previously will enjoy a happy Easter holidays. Okay? See you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you all soon. Enjoy Easter.